Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Longinusa, welcoming you to another edition of Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, the show where industry leaders, golf professionals, and legends all come and discuss the great game we love so much. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our host to tell us who's next on the tee. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe Longinusa. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me again this morning on Next on the Tee. Today, I have the privilege of having with me Steve Mona. I'm honored to say that this is Steve's fourth fourth visit with me on the show. He is annually ranked among the uh, top most powerful people in the game of golf. And, and what I love about having Steve on the show is talking to him about all the good things the game of golf does for our communities, for our economy, and for health. I mean, these are some things that I don't think people have enough awareness about. You know, I, I, there are so many benefits that don't uh, get nearly enough publicity, if at all, really. And things like the $4 billion, that's with a B now, $4 billion that the tour gives to charity annually. Plus, you know, just, you know, generally the stress relief you get and the health benefits you get from going out and actually playing the game and being outside and those sorts of things. So guess what? That's what we're going to talk about, those things. We're going to talk about that. Plus, you know, annual World Golf Day is coming up here in a few weeks. So we'll talk about that uh, as well when Steve joins me here in just a few moments. But before we get started... We're going to hear a word today from uh, one of our new sponsors, our friends over at Seymour Putters. Golfers, has this happened to you? Great drive. Perfect second shot on the green. Only the three or even four putts, shaking your head all the way back to the cart. I have good news. Help is on the way with the Seymour Putter. The Seymour Putter Company patented RST technology sets up the putter perfectly every time using a visible gun sight on the top line. Genius. It's like locking radar onto the target, in this case, the golf hole, putting the golfer in perfect position to make a reliable and consistent stroke. The 1999 U.S. Open and 2007 Masters Champions both use, you guessed it, the Seymour Putter. So if you're ready to make more putts and take strokes off your game, log on to Seymour.com. That's S-E-E-M-O-R-E.com and put a Seymour putter in your bag today. I'll tell you what, folks. When I got my Seymour putter, I dropped three balls down on the green, about 10 feet away, and all three right in the center of the cup. So I'm sold. Sign me up. How do I get one of these and get it in my bag? And now you know, we're fortunate enough that uh, we've, we've got a deal together with Seymour Putters to be a sponsor on this show. They've got dozens of models, uh, one that's sure to fit you know, your eye and your preferences. To get more information, go online to Seymour.com, and Seymour is S-E-E-M-O-R-E.com. All right, I want to kick off the show like we do every week by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military. We want to thank you for your daily sacrifices and all that you do to keep the rest of us safe. We also want to thank those of you who serve or have served in every branch of the military and public service. We truly appreciate what you do to preserve our freedoms and our liberties. It's through your strength and your efforts that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz and all the folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It's an honor for us to have our show be a part of your network. You can find us by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. I also want to let our veterans know, be sure to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. It's a great new site with a wealth of information designed right for veterans. There's news, articles specifically geared towards veterans that you're going to find on there. I'm, I'm sure you're going to make you find those articles very interesting and very beneficial to you. Again, it's globalvoiceforveterans.org. I also want to thank everyone listening in on uh, other great stations like iHeartRadio, as well as sites like Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, Player.fm, and Blog Talk Radio as well. Plus, if someone's dragging you to the mall or to the grocery store, or you're just tired of the same old, same old listening on your commutes, download the Player.fm or Stitcher apps on your smartphone so you can take us with you everywhere you go. Let us give you something fun to focus on while you're out and about. All right, now back with me on the Custom Golf Bags USA guest line is Steve Mona. Let me give you a little more background 
on speed. He's the CEO of the World Golf Foundation, the organization that manages the World Golf Hall of Fame, the first tee in golf 2020. He was the CEO of the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America for 14 years, the executive director of the Georgia State Golf Association here in Atlanta for over a decade. He is annually among Golf Digest's most powerful people in golf, and I am really excited that uh, he is back with me again this morning next on the tee. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for being back on the show. My pleasure, Chris. Uh, always good to be with you. Steve, we're we're just a couple of weeks away from the 8th Annual National Golf Day, which is going to be held on uh, Wednesday, April 15th, up on Capitol Hill. I know the premise every year is, you know, so you guys can ensure that the laws and regulations that impact the golf industry are fair and appropriate. But what are some specific goals that you actually have looking forward to the 2015 event that you're actually hoping to walk away from or walk away with? Well, there's really two main objectives this year, uh, the first of which is to continue the education process uh, that we've been undertaking for the last several years, eight to be exact. And specifically, we want to talk to both members of Congress and also the White House, and that's new in the last couple of years, our focus on the White House. But we want to really hit on five different uh, key points. First, the economic impact of golf. Second, the charitable impact of golf. Third, the environmental impact of golf. Fourth, the health and wellness benefits of golf. Mm-hmm. And then fifth, the affordability and accessibility of golf. There you go. So that's that's the first big piece that we're going to be focused on with members of Congress and the White House. And then secondly, there's two specific uh, pieces of legislation that we're interested in, one having to do with uh, ensuring that golf facilities are eligible for tax uh, consideration in the case of natural disasters, and also similarly in the case of um, donating land for conservation easements. So those get a little technical, but those are two issues we're also interested in. This year, you mentioned focus now a little bit more on the White House. So you know, I, I've got some other things I want to get into with you about that, Steve. But talk about you know that piece, that piece specifically. You know, what's got you guys actually, are you you opening doors in the White House? Are you getting the opportunity to sit down with Barack Obama? Who in the White House are you guys going to get to chat with? Well, last year, for instance, we met uh, in the West Wing, not with the president, some of his key economic advisors. And the message there was to talk about the $70 billion almost in economic impact that golf creates annually, the $2 million job that it creates. And as you know, the White House is very interested in – the economy for obvious reasons. And sure. so our message was, look, we're, we're a significant contributor to, um, to our economic prowess in the U S this year, we're going to focus more on the vice president's office and uh, we're still sorting out who we're going to be meeting with there. But um, we, we just want to make sure that uh, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue are aware of the impact <laughs> of the golf industry. There you go. So, to your point, Steve, you know, I always, you know, dollar figures always get everybody's attention. So, to your point, what reaction do you get when you tell people, whether it's you know up in D.C. or you know you, you're traveling all the time all across the world, when you're telling people that you know the golf industry generates seventy billion dollars again with a B, and annually gives four billion dollars to charity, when you talk about numbers that high, what kind of reaction do you get? Well, people when surprised? I put it in. Co- Absolutely. And when I put it in this context, and here's the way I normally couch it. First, I talk about economic impact from this standpoint, that golf as an industry is larger than the spectator sports industry, and it's larger than the performing arts industry. And then I ask people just to think about those two industries for a minute in the context of their daily lives, and then think about golf. And we're larger than both of those. So that really puts it in a greater context than a somewhat abstract number. Um, And in the second, on the case of the charitable impact, here's the context that I try to create. I say, think of what the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the NHL generate for charity annually, and know that golf generates more by itself than those four sports do cumulatively. And and when I do that, it really opens eyes, and um, people are almost – you, you hate to make absolute statements, but uh, generally speaking, people are very surprised with both of those statistics. I bet they are too. So, you know, Steve, when 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 you when you talk about numbers that high and the reactions that you get, you know, do, do you find that people 
are people buying in? Do they go, you know, well, like really, wow, that's crazy? Or you know, do they call you on that sort of thing? How how do people react when you get that sort of you know those sort of dollar figures? And to your to your point, one of the things that I always love that you share, like I say, that four billion dollars to charity when it is more than the other what you know call major sports, right? The four major sports, you know, do combined. I mean, I just think that's a staggering number. So to that point, I do have skeptics, but the way that I relate it to everyday uh, life, if you will, is I say, look, in the case of golf, and this is just part of the industry, it's a big part of it, but we have over 15,000 facilities that, for the most part, now some parts of the country, obviously, they're not open year-round, but in a lot of parts of the country, they're open every single day of the year versus other businesses that are only open for certain periods of time. You take spectator yeah. sports or performing arts, for instance. Yeah, so that's yeah. one piece. So I give it a little context that way. people. So then they start to see how that could be the case. And in yeah. case of charity, it's really pretty simple. Here's how it breaks down. We have a little bit north of 15,000 facilities. About 75% or 12,000 facilities conduct charitable events a year. They average 12 per uh, facility. So do the math, that's 144,000 charitable events. Each event averages about $28,000 to charity. So you do the math and you get almost $3.8 billion of the almost $4 billion just from that uh, source alone. So once I there break it down that way, then it, it tends to um, pass the smell test, so to speak. There you go. I know this year I read that uh, the President's Cup captains, Nick Price and Jay Haas, are planning to be a part of the National Golf Day up there with you. What can they help you achieve by being there? Well, they're going to be involved in the First Tee Congressional Breakfast, which is a longstanding event that brings members of Congress uh, together with key executives with the First Tee and also um, uh, participants in the First Tee to hear their story. And both Nick and uh, Jay will be present and make some remarks at that event. So that helps uh, with the star power of that particular event, if you will. And then secondly, they're going to be with us at the um, kickoff. We have a formal kickoff to National Golf Day. It takes place there on Capitol Hill, and um, I'll make some brief remarks there, and both Nick and Jay will be present there. So what it does, Chris, is it um, it shines a light on the event for us. It it creates uh, interest in the event. People uh, relate uh, to our stars on the PGA Tour. Both Nick and Jay certainly were. And so uh, it helps with the visibility event and the credibility that it has. When you joined me last time, and like I said uh, in the intro at the top of the show, Stephen, blessed to have you on the show three prior times to this. But And last time, last fall, we talked about the study done by the, the Karolinska Institute over in Sweden regarding their findings that the death rate for golfers, and you alluded, this, alluded to this a moment ago about the health benefits, but the death rate for golfers is 40% lower than for those people of, of the same you know, same gender, age, and socioeconomic status, which which equates to about a five-year increase in life in, life expectancy. So one more time, 40% lower than people that are exactly like them. So they get five extra years by playing the game of golf. Talk about the health benefits that actually getting outside, walking, playing the game of golf can have on people. Well, it's significant, and it's part of the um, whole story of golf that we need to do a much better job articulating. But the facts are that if you play 18 holes of golf, if you walk, and I realize not everybody does in our country particularly, it's much more of a walking game, as you know, in Europe, which is where the study was done. But the facts are you will take 10,000 steps or more playing 18 holes of golf and walking, and that's the recommended daily allowance, if you will, um, by any medical doctor um, that studies this particular area. So that alone takes care of the the walking piece of it. And then there's uh, obviously the benefits of being outdoors. Uh, There are benefits to uh, being with uh, friends, uh, being in a social setting, yet a competitive setting, yet a a natural setting. There's all sorts of benefits um, that I think a lot of people take for granted. And even if, and I realize in our country it's a, generally speaking anyway, a cart game. Uh, but even if you, if you do that, there's still um, there's still benefits there. You still burn a certain amount of calories. You're still going to take a certain amount of steps. You're still going to be in that outdoor setting. You're still going to be in that social environment. You're still going to be in that competitive environment, depending upon how you approach that. So 
there's just a lot of benefits that inure from being in the environment that um, golf creates. And so um, that's a part of our game that's been much overlooked, um, and we need to, like I said, focus more attention on it. Um, when when you get up to, to Capitol Hill here in a few weeks, you, uh, Jack Nicholas just won the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is fantastic. I'm a, I'm a huge Mr. Nicholas fan. Um, is he going to be joining you again uh, at the uh, at, up on Capitol Hill? I know he's been with you there in the past. He was with us last year. Unfortunately, not again uh, this year. You're right. He just uh, this past week uh, received that uh, uh, the Congressional Gold Medal, and then before that, um, as you alluded to, um, Charlie Sifford, the late Charlie Sifford, but uh, late last year received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So we've had a couple of great uh, figures in our game be honored at the highest levels. But uh, Mr. Nichols will not be with us, but we're, like we talked before, pleased to have Jay Haas and uh, Nick Price with us this year. Right. Steve, so much of the PGA's marketing efforts are focused around bringing more young people into the game, which which I get, you know, is how you grow the game long term. But couldn't this be, you know, a point, you know, this being, you know, the, the health benefits and everything that, that you talked about a moment ago, couldn't this be a point for getting more people, middle-aged and senior players, out playing the game as well? Absolutely. Um, if you look at it from the standpoint of people who either play the game some or not at all, and if we're able to articulate our case that, look, by playing this game, uh, you can – engage in an activity that will help you from an overall health and wellness standpoint and possibly even a longevity standpoint, I would think that uh, most people would uh, be quite interested, and particularly a game that um, doesn't require a a team of people to play. There's not uh, any kind of real injury risk. Right. By and large, I'm not saying that right. it's devoid of it, but by and large, you're you're, you're generally not. You're not get blowing out an ACL out there. That's right. That's right. You're not going to get <laughs> elbowed and knock a tooth out or anything like that. So um, so it's it, it's that and and like I said, and I saw it in my own father who passed away uh, almost three years ago. I, I can assure you, in his case, it lengthened his life just because he had something to look forward to. He had friends to play with and. Um, and to be outdoors with and kid around with. And, and that piece um, of the game really doesn't get articulated very much or, or really at all, And but it's an important part of it. And so uh, overall, yeah. to your larger point, it's a, it's a message I think that would resonate with people uh, at that kind of middle age point in their lives. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. My father's the same way. Out there, you know, he's playing. He's playing four or five times a week out there with his buddies out on, the, on on his golf course. So yeah, I think it does a great deal of good things for you as well, just to get out and be with people. But that's that's an, that's an excellent point, um, Steve. You you do some great work with the First Tee organization, and you know, over the last you know twenty plus years now, Tiger Woods has been a major impact with attracting kids to the game of golf. His his influence, I'm sure, is diminishing a bit now, but who are some of the players that you're hearing that kids are starting to identify more with now? Well, I think if you look at it from the men's side of the game, uh, you'd have to start with Ricky Fowler. Uh, Ricky, and he really played well last year, finishing in the top five of all four majors. He's a colorful character. He's a good kid. He really resonates with young people. Jordan Spieth would be a second uh, person I would point to, 21 years old. Uh, tremendous success already on the tour. I think he'll be around for a long time, and yeah. he seems to connect well. And then there's Rory McIlroy. I really realize he doesn't live here in the United States, although he spends a great deal of time uh, in South Florida. He probably spends more time there than in Ireland. Um, but uh, Rory also, so physically fit, good kid, uh, mm-hmm. very open and um, and very genuine. So I think those three on the men's side are great ambassadors for the game going forward. And then let's talk about the women's side too. You've got Michelle Wee. Michelle's been around a long time, but she's only 25 years old. Just won the women's open last year. She resonates. Right. Lexi Thompson um, won the LPGA's first major last year. Um, she's only 19 or 20 years old, so she's going to be around for a while. And then even um, young Lydia Ko, who um, uh, also not an American, uh, much like Rory, right. but um, but she, uh, at 17 years old, um, is what in the top number one in the world. So um, right. she also um, 
has that kind of it factor also. So I, so I think the game's really in good hands in terms of the younger people coming on the scene. They understand uh, the, the power, if you will, that they wield, and they, um, they understand the game and what it means. And I think they're great ambassadors for the game. You know, Steve, we, you know, some folks have been out there for the last few years kind of, you know, crying for golf's gloom and doom that the, that the game is shrinking. We keep hearing about golf courses closing at, a, at an alarming rate. Brian Gumbel threw out there a stat on his, uh, his show on HBO Real Sports that golf courses close somewhere in America every 48 hours. PolitiFact, check that out, and it's close. I mean, it's about every 61 hours if you actually do the math. But on the flip side, your social media campaign for National Golf Day last year reached 7.2 million people. I, I take that back. 7.2 million people in 2013, but 16 million people last year. So to me, that starts to suggest that more people have an interest in the game of golf. And you're, in your mind, golf getting less popular or more popular? If you uh, define golf's popularity in the broadest possible terms, it's getting more popular. And by that, I mean if you define it beyond just simply playing the game, which obviously is a huge part of it, and I'm not going to minimize it. But if you look at it also from the entertainment standpoint, how many people are going to live golf events, how many people are tuning in during the course of the year, how many people are following golf through some form of social media, there's actually more people engaged with the game now we're at our highest point ever. Yet your point is very well made, Chris, that if you read the kind of the mainstream uh, media, if you will, um, you would draw a different conclusion. And and here's really what it boils down, Chris. There's really there's two different elements to golf. There's the facility side of the game, the 15,350 courses. And what's going on there? Uh, is a rebalancing, basically. And it happens in in virtually all industries. We did get overbuilt, um, but we are in the process right now of creating equilibrium with respect to supply and demand. And we're probably about two to three years away from getting back in sync, if you will. So we will. I'll just tell you, Chris, we'll have another two, three years where we're going to close more facilities than we're going to open in the United States. And we should all just all take a deep breath and just understand that's part of this rebalancing that's going on. But the game is still solid at that level. There, We have about 25 million people who play it, about 21 million of whom are, are what we would call committed to the game. They intend to be part of the game going forward. So it's a solid core to uh, to our sport. On the other hand, the entertainment side of the game has never been healthier. The PGA Tour – they're playing more events for more prize money, donating more money to charity. More people are tuning in on a cumulative basis on an annual um, calendar, if you will. And so from that standpoint, uh, it's very healthy. The LPGA, after having um, a bit of a lull over the last several years, has been phenomenally successful. Now, um, all their metrics are at all-time highs. You look at the USGA and the rights fee deal uh, that it did with Fox, uh, and they'll start broadcasting the U.S. Open um, this year uh, in June, and that was a record number in terms of the um, rights fees that Fox paid to the USGA. And the same thing happened with the PGA of America a year or two ago with uh, NBC with respect to the Ryder Cup. So here, here's my bottom line. I don't think entities like Fox and NBC would be investing the way they are in the game if they felt like it was shrinking or losing popularity, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, no, absolutely right. That's a great point. Steve, a couple more be, before we let you go. Um, Matt Adams and I were talking a couple of weeks ago about the potential impact that TaylorMade's decision to open retail outlet stores could have on the golf retail industry. I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts, what, what you think that you know, that decision is going to do to, you know, to the big box stores like the PGA Superstore, uh, plus you know, do, you, do you think the other brands, if successful, are going to follow suit? Well, a couple points, Chris. First, um, first of all, we need to realize this is not unusual in the world of retail generally. I mean, the best example of that are Apple stores, which are all over the place, and that's a manufacturer opening its own store, and it's done very well, obviously. The, the second point, though, is, and it's a question more than a statement, is will the opening of this retail store lead to others, and we'll see is the answer to that. But the bigger question is, 
will it actually expand the pie, if you will, versus yeah. cannibalizing sales? And you can make an argument, and I don't know the answer to that candidly. That's why I'm posing a question, not making a statement. So we'll see if it if it's a zero-sum game where it pulls from other retailers, for instance, to use your example. Or yeah. maybe perhaps it just expands the market. So time will tell. And then to, to respond to your second question, so based upon what happens, whether it expands the market or if it is a zero-sum game, then I think that will – have a lot to do with whether you see other uh, manufacturers enter into this space as well. And so my view is if, if it does expand the market, then I think you'll probably see others. Um, it a lot depends upon their own philosophy of how they go to market. But um, if it, it if it doesn't, then I think then everyone's going to have to take a look at it. But time will tell on that, and um, I think it's interesting, and we'll just have to see how it all plays out. Yeah, I, it, one of the things that you touched on when uh, at the top when you were talking about you know what you're trying to do with the uh, World Golf Day is one of the things you mentioned was cost of the game. And Steve, you know, one of the things that that I contend that could have a major impact on the cost of the game is you know from an equipment perspective, tying into this last topic, not many people can afford to go buy sort of the the latest and greatest technology, the newest driver. Right, those things seem to be coming out. If it's not once a year, sometimes in in some cases it's twice a year with new technology. And those, you know, the newest drivers that cost you, you know, four or five hundred dollars. Some sets of irons are, you know, come out retailing at, you know, near a thousand dollars. But if if TaylorMade's cost, and I'm just making some suppositions here, Steve, if TaylorMade's cost for a new driver is about hundred and fifty dollars, that's what it costs them to make their latest driver. And they normally sell it to someone like the big box stores for two hundred and fifty dollars wholesale, so they can make their margin. And then the big box place has to turn around and sell it for you know three hundred ninety nine dollars to make their margin. It, it just would seem to me that if TaylorMade could cut out you know the big box places and just go straight to selling the newest driver for that two hundred and fifty dollars that they were selling at wholesale, so they continue to make the same amount of margin. I would think that would bring more people, more players, to be able to buy that newest driver maybe more frequently. Because, you know, like I say, it's it's hard to afford four or five hundred dollars every year, or every other year, to just to you know just to put a new driver in your bag. Well, it's an interesting uh, hypothesis that you're stating there, Chris. And, and again, I, I don't know the answer to it, but I will say this: uh, the other piece. To, to that whole discussion is um, is maintaining the pricing structure at retail. And, and I don't know, and again, this is a question, not a statement, um, yeah. whether TaylorMade would want to have one price point at their stores and another price point at um, big box retailers and then maybe a third price point um, at green grass shops. So it's a pretty complicated matter, and I, I just don't know what the thinking is. I really can't comment on, um, right. on how that's that out. I think in a vacuum, your point makes sense. I just don't know in in the world of retail if that's the way it'll play out. Right. Well, Steve, one one more before we let you go. You know, as head of the World Golf Foundation, which you know runs the the World Golf Hall of Fame, you know, I I got to get a plug in here for for our friend Dave Stockton and his record. I know you've got Freddie Couples. You know, induction this year. You had uh, David Graham, great, great guy, been on our show as well last year. Um, Mr. Stockton has got, he's, he's got to be he's got, he's got to be standing at the front door, doesn't he? I mean, his record, you know, very similar to to Freddie's got a little more, uh, you know, another major that Freddie didn't have, and very comparable to David Graham. What's your thoughts on uh, Dave Stockton's opportunity to finally get into the World Golf Hall of Fame? Well, first of all, with respect to the Hall of Fame, I'll just make one comment, and then I'll respond directly to your question. Um, we'll, we'll be uh, taking the World Golf Hall of Fame to St. Andrews, Scotland, the Monday of the Open Championship. And this is the first time to take it away from the World Golf Hall of Fame itself in St. Augustine, Florida. And we're going to start a rotation um, where we're going to – we'll be at the Hall of Fame, uh, and then two years later we'll be someplace else around the world. We'll be back to the Hall of Fame in 2017, and then we'll be uh, at uh, Pebble Beach the Monday of the U.S. Open for the 2019 section. Nice. So anyway, so we're and this year we're really excited uh, with the class, which includes, as you mentioned, David Graham will be inducted in July. Marco Mira will be joining David, as will Laura Davies, and the late A. W. Tillinghast will also be honored. So that's our class, and we've we've really uh, pretty much completely renovated uh, the uh, whole selection process, and, and we're quite pleased with with where we are. Yeah. 
So now, with respect to Mr. Stockton, um, he, trust me, he is uh, and has been and continues to be, um, shall I say, well in uh, the discussion. And we and so it's hard for me. I can't predict uh, when it might be. Uh, but I can say this: the 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 statement that we make with respect to the Hall of Fame is um, it's not no, it's just not now. And I think in the case of Mr. Stockton, that's probably a true statement. So um, we'll just have to see how things evolve in the future. Uh, it, a lot has to do with who's eligible in a certain year. So, for instance, in 2017, Tiger Woods will be eligible. I think he has a pretty good chance. Um, so, you know, so in cases like that, um, it, it's not just necessarily where, well, you you didn't quite get in this year. It means you're going to get in the following. A lot depends upon who come, becomes eligible. But looking out into the future after Tiger becomes eligible for 17, um, I think there's some, um, shall I say, some open seas for people like Dave Stockton, who um, whose record – was from a number of years ago, but have a very solid record. So um, time will tell, but uh, again, uh, not uh, no, but just not now. Okay. All right. Well, that's good news for, for me and uh, everyone uh, who's a Dave, Stock- Dave Stockton fan. Wonderful man. Steve, um, thank you for taking time out of your morning to come back and be a part of this show. It's uh, it's always you know a privilege for me to get the opportunity to talk with you. Remind our listeners how they can stay up to date with all the things you know, that you're doing both, uh, you know, online and then, uh, of course, over social media as well. Well, the, the easiest thing to do would be to, um, first of all, the, the website that I would direct everybody to is uh, worldgolffoundation.org. Um, and that, from there, you can bridge to all these different initiatives that I've been talking about. And that's the simplest place. Um and then uh, from a uh, social media perspective, uh, the most our most active social media presence is through uh, We Are Golf. So just following us um, at We Are Golf would be the best way because that's the most active presence we have from a social media perspective. So okay. those would be the two outlets, Chris, that I would say are the easiest way to keep up with what we're doing. That's great stuff. Steve, thanks again, like I say, for uh, taking a few minutes out of your uh, morning to be a part of the show. It's like it's uh, it's always so so wonderful to get the opportunity to talk with you directly. Best of luck up on Capitol Hill on National Golf Day again on April the 15th. I hope you'll uh, come back, join us afterwards, talk about how it went, and give us your perspective plus insights uh, on what's going on around the game of golf because you're, uh, you're always fantastic to talk to. Well, thank you, Chris, and I'd be delighted to do that. And I wanted to first thank you for what you do to uh, help support the game through this show. And then, much like you did, I want to uh, thank all of our men and women who uh, unselfishly uh, fight and uh, represent our country uh, through their uh, efforts through the armed services. So I want to thank uh, all of those uh, men and women as well. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Steve, all the best to you your family, and everyone at uh, the World Golf Foundation. I look forward to catching up with you again, hopefully real soon. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Steve. Steve Mona. Again, the two sites he mentioned, worldgolffoundation.org, and follow him on uh, Twitter, at WeAreGolf. So great stuff from Steve Mona. Can't thank him enough for taking time out of his busy schedule to be a part of the show this morning. All right. Before we close up shop, folks, speaking of uh, of Dave Stockton. I want to mention uh, the great book by both he and uh, Dave Stockton Jr. called Own Your Own Game. Most of us and I, you know, talking to friends still up in the in the northeast, still snowed it's snowing today. Can you imagine that? Up in uh, up in the northeast Connecticut, Massachusetts in that area. So folks aren't able to get out and sharpen your game by actually playing and getting getting your swing and rust and getting the rust off of that. So let's start the golf season by getting our minds right because so much of the game is played between our ears. In, the, in his latest book, the Stocktons let you know about you know how to play uh, you know winning golf through the power of the mind. Own your own game recreates the experience of riding 18 holes with Dave Stockton at one of his highly sought after corporate outings and draws from his experience as a as, as a champion both on the on the regular tour and the senior tour and as also as a revered coach. So he tells you how to 
think better, stay calmer, execute more consistently, and most importantly, like we talked about with Steve Mona, how to enjoy the game more thoroughly, right? Go to StocktonGolf.com to get your copy, and for a couple extra dollars, he'll even autograph it for you. I got mine autographed, so it's a great thing, and it's a great keepsake, and it's a, it's a book that you're going to refer back to time and time again, again, to help keep your mind sharp when you're playing the game. All right, everybody, it's time for me to put a bow on this one. My sincere thanks one more time to Steve Mona for being a great guest with me this morning. And I thank you for tuning in. You know that uh, we here appreciate you the very most. Please also check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me, my co-host Bob Lazari, and our announcer, Joe Lajanusa. That show airs live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Blog Talk Radio and starting at 10.15 p.m. Eastern Time on the Armed Forces Radio Network. On Friday nights, you can hear us from 8 to 10 on Boost Radio. They rebroadcast the show Friday nights, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time Live on their site, and then uh, starting at 11 o'clock again uh, on Armed Forces Radio. We're joined every week on that show by legends from around both the NFL and the CFL. Great guests. We have typically five to seven current or former players join us every single week. So we hope you'll come listen to the show, check us out. And give us a like on Facebook. You can find, you know, Thursday Night Tailgate and Next on the T, both on on Facebook. So please give us a like. That's important to us, too. And you can find out, you know, who our upcoming guests are going to be. You can stream or download any of our archive episodes for this show by going to nextonthetea.net or thursdaynighttailgate.com. All right, everybody. Thank you again for listening and uh, making the decision to listen to the show today. I appreciate it very much. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends.